Good evening. The idea of investing based on a set of principles, in addition to looking for profit, is not new. In fact, it is probably as old as investing itself. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining our City UAE webinar on ESG, a topic which is gaining increasing interest with billions of dollars moved into ESG funds over the last few years and cumulative assets amounting to trillions of US dollars. My name is Thomas Bortnik, and tonight I will have the honor to host our webinar. On a day-to-day -day basis, I'm in charge of Wealth Management Product Department in City UAE. My team and I are responsible for delivery of banking, as well as investments, insurance, and advisory solutions to our UAE clients. I am joining you from our Dubai office. Joining us from London, all of them, are our guest speakers. And whilst you can find their short biographies in the right-hand side panel, right there, uh, let me uh, allow me to uh, introduce them shortly. Suwei Wong is head of portfolio solution sales with City Private Bank. Hannah Simmons is head of sustainability strategy at Schroders. Leoniers is head of Franklin Templeton Academy for EMEA. Sincere welcome to our experts, and I do look forward to our discussion. You can post your questions to us throughout the course of this webinar via the box at the bottom of the screen. We will aim to answer them during a short Q and A session towards the end. Let us begin. Hannah, what is ESG? Well, thank you, Thomas, for that first question. And thank you very much for um, inviting me along to speak to your guests tonight. Um, I think that's the perfect first question to make sure that we all are on the same page regarding the, the topic for discussion. So ESG at its heart um, considers three areas, environment, social and governance. When we're talking about the environment, we mean things like um, climate change, or I think of them as being extreme weather conditions. On the social side, um, we're considering things like diversity in the workplace, or health and safety um, records or incidents. And on the governance side, that's really about how management um, is supporting and looking after the companies um, that they own. Um, it's looking at accounting fraud, and um, is there any discrimination going on within the workforce? Okay, and um, uh, Leo, I believe uh, you're, you're being in the professional education business, you might have some slides for us to explain to us what ESG investing is, if you could do that, Leo. Thank you, Thomas, and it's indeed a pleasure to be part of this uh, panel today. And uh, ESG investing, which we call sustainable investing at Franklin Templeton, is a fluid concept with different asset managers using different terminology to address it. So we see sustainability, uh, sustainable investing as a discipline that takes into account important aspects of environmental, social and governance issues in order to increase returns, manage risks, or to align to a social or environmental outcome. So if we move to the next slide, then we see that sustainable investing is basically an umbrella term that encompasses several different categories. And all sustainable investing is rooted into ESG integration, which is the systematic and explicit inclusion of material ESG factors in investment analysis and investment decisions. So beyond ESG integration, there are basically four sustainable product solutions with different objectives, which might suit different investor needs. So those are thematic solutions, values driven solutions, ESG tilted solutions and impact focused solutions. So let's quickly define them and distinguish uh, the main objectives between them. So if we start with um, thematic solutions, so thematic solutions basically uh, invest in issuers that try to address environmental or social challenges via their products and services. So for example, thematic investment solutions might invest in companies that try to address um, water management or sustainable agriculture or health products. And thematic solutions often use positive screening, which means that rather than to exclude companies, which I'll mention shortly, the portfolio manager tried to include companies which set positive examples uh, of companies that address environmental or social benefits. 
The next product solution is values driven, which sometimes is also referred to as socially responsible investing or SRI. And this is for investors that want to earn a return, but also don't want to invest in certain stocks based on certain ethical or religious criteria. Think of, for example, avoiding stocks that are involved in producing of weapons, uh, alcohol, tobacco, or human rights abuses. So value-driven solutions often use negative screening. That means that the portfolio manager will absolutely not invest in those stocks that are deemed harmful based on certain ethical or social criteria. Another type of solution is ESG tilted. And ESG tilted is sometimes referred to as best in class, which means that um, the portfolio manager tries to invest in stocks with leading or improving ESG standards. For example, a portfolio manager might decide to only invest in stocks which have best in class governance models. And just as with thematic, ESG tilted might use positive screening. And finally, there is impact focused investments. So impact focused investments are for investors which have a dual objective that want to earn a return, but also want to achieve a measurable um, environmental or social benefit when it comes to, for example, microvinance, conservation, or for example, social real estate. So those are four different sustainable solutions that are available for investors with different objectives suiting different investor needs. Over to you, Thomas. Um, thank you, Leo. Um, uh, Leo, uh, whilst we're on the topic of, of ESG and those uh, various different scenarios that you mentioned, can you give us some maybe positive examples of ESG in practice? Uh, what, what would be a good examples that you could illustrate the, the kind of theory with? Sure. Think of uh, Ford Motor Company, for example, which spent two and a half million uh, dollar in a new wastewater treatment system in its assembly plant in Pretoria, which allowed them to reuse 15% of their wastewater, which led to increased efficiency, less vulnerability to water scarcity, and hence uh, uh, led to a competitive advantage for Ford Motor Company. Another example on the social side is, for example, imagine that an, uh, an airline is involved in a major um, labor dispute, right, which basically uh, results in the stock price being at an all time low. Let's say the ESG analyst finds out that the labor dispute improves, right, that means that the asset manager can buy the stock at a near trough valuation while expecting the stock price to improve because of the improving labor dispute. So okay. those are some examples around environmental and social factors. Um, thank, thank you for that, Leo. Um, Sue, uh, what, about, uh, what about Citibank's own ESG agenda? Can you give us some positive examples from, from there? Sure, thanks for the question, Thomas. And maybe I can put more, more theory into practical examples. So, um, I would say, you know, city has been part of the sustainability conversation now for over 20 years. So ESG isn't something that is new um, to us. You know, we first joined the UN Environment Programme Finance Initiative in 1997. Um, and since then, we've held many leadership roles along the way, such as co-creating the Green Bond Principles in 2014. And we also published our Green Bond Framework in 2019. You know, and as we've read, or as we know, there's been a huge rise in green bond issuance, you know, as companies and governments really focus on environmental initiatives. So we saw green bond issuance hit a record high last year of 270 billion, you know, and expectations for this are to reach over 400 billion this year. You know, City ourselves, we've also um, launched over two and a half billion um, in green bonds since 2019. So it's important for City to help frame and shape many of the policy standards, um, and we want to be seen um, by, uh, by leading by, by example. So, you know, Jane Fraser, our CEO, she has made it very clear that positive um, impact um, and ESG is something that she wants 
to see integrated into the business. So not something that sits as a separate layer on top. You know, as her first day as CEO, she committed to the goal of net zero operational targets by 2050. Um, and she really did announce a series of bolder commitments, such as a sustainable financing goal at one trillion, so, and this really encompasses investments across all key social sectors. So we're looking at affordable housing, we're looking at healthcare, we're looking at workforce development within these initiatives um, and aligning these with the UN Sustainable Development Goals as well. Just looking at some of the more recent initiatives, you know, that, that, that we've driven as well. I think, you know, it's important to, to note that we launched our first impact fund in January 2020. So this was the largest fund of its kind at the time to be launched by a bank using our own capital. And what we wanted to do here was really identify investments in what we call double bottom line companies. So not only companies that can really drive positive societal change, but also deliver strong financial returns. Um, and also another consideration when we did set this up was we recognized that there's significant gender um, and minority um, ethnic gaps in the startup uh, world. So this was also part of our commitment to allocate to those investments um, being led or owned by women and minorities. So today we've invested in over 13 companies. Um, and if I look at those companies and the sectors that we've invested in, they've been incredibly diverse. We've looked at FinTech, MedTech, you know, resource um, management um, as well, so, so resource efficiency um, management. And, and lastly, just to close, you know, I think with all of these commitments that not only City um, are committing to, but other companies, accountability is really key. Um, so here at City, we really publicly report on our progress um, on all of our ESG initiatives. Um, and we want to be transparent on how we're progressing um, on our sustainability goals as well. Well, thank you, Soway. That was very comprehensive, I thought. Um, let's switch and, uh, and speak about something which, uh, which I'm sure the audience would, uh, would like to hear about, and that is the retail investor perspective. So basically, what is the appeal of ESG and kind of what aspirations are investors realizing when going this route? Is it realizing the social awareness and responsibility goals, or is it more the hope of investing sustainably and through that achieving a relatively good uh, potential return? Uh, who are the main demographics interested in it? What is your experience, Suway? Sure. Well, I would say, you know, investors are definitely starting to recognize that, you know, non-financial factors can pose a material risk to a company's performance. Um, so they're pushing for clarity when it comes to a company's take on social um, and environmental issues. Um, and thinking more about the financial consequences that a company can face if it really doesn't adapt um, to this change. So. You know, COVID has definitely served as a catalyst to the ESG agenda. I think there's no doubt about that. You know, and but it's also led to different drivers and, and pressures, um, which we've seen has has led to new trends and also emerging opportunities. So, just quickly on the drivers um, and and the pressures that we're seeing, you know, there's definitely been increased regulatory um, um, requirements, especially in the EU, that have recently come into um, come into play. Um, so, you know, with these requirements. Um, you know, the EU are really emphasizing mainstream climate risk analysis within the financial framework. You know, it's not, not just the EU, we've seen it in Asia, um, the UK, Europe, China, uh, for example. I think, secondly, the political landscape is changing as well. Um, you've seen countries committing to net zero um, targets um, and also investor and client pressure as well. So um, investors want to actively engage and use their shareholder stake um, to motivate um, and change as well. So these drivers have definitely brought more environmental and, and social factors um, to the fore. You know, I think, you know, E was very much um, on the rise. You know, think back to Davos in, in, in 2020, you know, that was really focused on the environment and climate change. You, know, you see Biden's recent G7 meeting, um, Build Back Better um, in the World Partnership there. Um, and, and, and that is, you know, not only governments, but private sector also um, becoming um, involved. Um, and within that, you've, you've definitely seen social considerations becoming more important. And I think, you know, this trend will, will definitely continue. It's starting to matter a lot more to investors and Hannah touched upon this, you know, how companies treat their employees, how diverse they are, how they interact with their supply chains um, and their um, communities as well. 
Um, in terms of return, you touched, you know, you asked about return. Um, I think there's always been some discussion about aligning your investments with your values has to be somehow concessionary. Um, and I would mention, you know, a couple of things. In my client conversations, it isn't the case that clients are looking for better returns. Um, they want commensurate returns, um, but they want to see, you know, align their investments um, uh, with, with, with their values. Um, and we're definitely seeing that high quality um, ESG investments um, do deliver that. And I think if you, if you think about what's happening at the moment, increasingly doing the right thing um, is, is, is doing the uh, profitable thing as well. All right, thank you, thank you for that, Sway. I know, uh, I know, Leo had a slide that he wanted to show us on on returns. So, Leo, uh, from a returns perspective, uh, how does ESG add value to a client's portfolio? Is there empirical science behind it uh, that that kind of shows me that looking uh, looking beyond the social aspect has has its value? Uh, uh, do I, you know, do I make extra returns? Or do I not make returns? Do you want to cover that topic? Yeah, sure, Thomas. And uh, I would like to, uh, to emphasize that uh, you cannot state that uh, higher rated ESG uh, companies guarantee um, outperformance. But there have been many studies, obviously, trying to uh, relate uh, ESG ratings of corporates to investment performance. And MSCI took a, a, a little different approach where it's looked at the, the, the fundamentals, such as profitability in relation to ESG uh, ratings. And what it found is that over a period between 2009 and 2017, that the uh, top quintile, or in other words, the uh, best 20% of highly rated ESG corporates tended to outperform the bottom quintile or the worst um, uh, rated ESG corporates by as much as 11%, right? And obviously, a higher profitability might lead to a better investment performance. And this can be because of better uh, use of resources, for example, or because higher rated ESG corporates tend to obviously uh, be better in innovation management or setting better incentives for their management. So that was an outcome of a study of MSCI relating ESG to profitability. Over that to was you, very thanks. positive, uh, Leo. Uh, Hannah, would you like to add to that? Anything, anything you 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 feel differently, or or maybe you want to add? Thank you. And um, Leo gave a really comprehensive um, overview of some MSCI research. And if I may, I just wanted to add a few um, additional thoughts. And um, there was a, a paper released um, a few months ago by the um, New York, sorry, New York Stern University, and they had looked at um, evidence from a number of studies on um, the sustainability and um, performance for um, a number of sustainable funds. And what they're seeing, and I, I think that, um, you know, we heard this from Sue Wei, but we've also um, heard it from, from Leo, that um, whilst they um, didn't find um, enormous outperformance, what they did find was a couple of things. Firstly, lower risk. And so in drawdowns, in those more extreme um, market environments, and um, sustainable funds generally um, lost less money. And that's something we certainly saw um, through uh, the, the sort of early part of last year as um, the, the, the battle with COVID began. And the other thing they found, and I think this is really interesting when we think about how new um, sustainable investing is in the, the sort of longer um, world of investing, and um, is that actually, for funds that ha are around for longer, you do begin to see that persistence of um, return coming through and them outperforming. So I think those are two other important data points as we think about um, you know, does sustainable investing um, pay? I see. Um, okay, so that was all very, very positive, I should say. Um, but now let's take a look at it from maybe another, uh, another angle. Um, so hey, if I was to build a portfolio which is 100% ESG, what are some of the risks which you think that would create for, for me? Yeah, I, I mean, I think all investment strategies do come with their inherent risks and, and so ESG is, is no different. 
you know, some of the key considerations I think to think about would revolve around, you know, the opaqueness of data transparency and reporting, and also the, the need for more education. I think, you know, ESG has seen a very rapid rise over the past, you know, um, couple of years. And so investors really need to be able to make more informed um, and accurate decisions. So unfortunately, there isn't a single uniform um, definition of ESG investing. Um, and so the interpretation of these set of standards can be quite broad and, and subjective. Um, you know, when, when I speak to some, some clients who are interested in this, I think, you know, many investors tend to look at rating agencies um, as an example to inform um, their decisions. And, you know, rating agencies, they will typically assign an overall rating for a company or a rating for each E, S and G category. However, you know, it's important to note that the variation in methodologies can vary hugely. You know, companies essentially report their own data. You know, they can also adopt different metrics, weightings, research. So it can lead to very varying outcomes for the same company, depending you know, on which provider you're looking for. So I think that, that that's something to, to consider in, in terms of you know, risks, if, if, if you like. Um, and also, I think market capitalization is also something to, to, you know, to take into account. It's expensive to gather this data. And so you know, large um, capitalization companies, they tend to um, have the cost base to absorb that. Um, but smaller cap companies tend not to have that. So it doesn't mean that they're necessarily bad from an ESG perspective. It's just they don't report. Um, and, and so that could be um, a missed opportunity. So I would say, you know, definitely rating companies, a very useful metric in informing your decision. Um, but you definitely have to look at the, the nuances um, of that. Um, also, and, and Leo did touch upon this, I think it's important to look at the ways providers are incorporating ESG into the management of the portfolios that you're interested in, you know, be it pure exclusionary or SRI, for example, you know, is it integration, is it impact? Um, here at the private bank, we actually look at investments through a more holistic portfolio lens. So it starts off with a conversation with the client, you know, what are your long-term goals? What are, what are the risks um, and returns that you're looking for? Um, and, and really it starts with asset allocation because we all know that really asset allocation drives much of the long-term um, return. And then we can start to think about how to populate um, a portfolio. I think in many of my conversations with clients on this topic, you know, investors get very excited about the thematic side of ESG. It's more tangible to, to them, you know, um, you know, be it water, be it gender equality or renewables or electric vehicles. Um, and, and that's all fine and, and good, but I think investors need to be aware of how that, that, that can play out in your portfolio and the potential volatility that, that it can add. So, you know, just one data point, if you look at the Global Alternative Energy Index, you know, that returned 108% last year, you know, investors very, very positive on renewables, on, you know, electric vehicles, but it's down now 25% from its January peak. And, and this year, we've seen a little bit of a pivot back to traditional energy as well. So, you, you know, I, I would say just be aware of the volatility that certain tilts um, of, of ESG investments can um, add uh, to your portfolio and think about diversification um, within that. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, I have a question for Hanan, uh, next one, which is uh, you're someone who is running a sustainable strategy at Shredders. So now, uh, could you tell us how the selection process works? So, you know, uh, what would be the key positive and negative screening criteria that you would apply to, to select your investments into this strategy? Thank you, Thomas. And if I may, I was going to um, start that response by picking up on uh, some important comments that Sue Wei made um, in her um, previous um, uh, discussion discussion around um, rating agencies. I think it's really important when you start um, to build your investment portfolio, when you're starting to identify those companies that you would like to invest in, um, you need to um, undertake thorough research. And whilst um, buying data or um, taking the, the information from third party ratings is certainly one of the inputs that you, you can use um, at Schroeder's, and we've actually built our own suite of proprietary tools. And the purpose behind those is to really help our investors understand the sustainability characteristics of those underlying companies. 
we don't think it's possible to distill the complexity um, that sustainability or ESG represents into one single number or a letter. And um, so for us, we look at sustainability through multiple lenses. And so one of the ways that we think about it is um, by considering the, the cost, the impact that companies um, have on society. And so we've built a tool that helps us understand the financial cost and benefit that organisations bring um, by virtue of their business operations and the products and services that they make available. So for example, things like um, the cost to society as a result of carbon emissions, the benefit we all derive because of the wages um, that we get paid or the innovation um, that companies are making in order to find better solutions to the future. And so by coming up with a financial cost, we can identify those companies and um, that could see considerable impact on their bottom line if those financial costs um, actually come to fruition. And the way I think about it, in the past few years, we've seen the introduction of plastic taxes, um, of sugar taxes. So these take those social impacts that companies um, have and transfer them onto the, the cost base of the company. So looking through that lens is helpful in identifying and um, companies that, that could you know, benefit and um, there's two sides to sustainability it also is opportunities not just risks but could benefit as a result of those but also those that um, might see considerable cost. The other way that we think about sustainability is also to um, really look at how companies are navigating the relationship with each of their key stakeholders. In our view a company that's able to navigate to support all of its stakeholders, and um, so that's including its employees, its customers, its suppliers, and um, it's the, the regulators, um, it's the community in which um, each company um, operates in, and finally looking after our environment. So a company that takes into account the needs and objectives and the risks and opportunities with each of those different stakeholder groups is more likely to succeed. So that's another lens through which we look. And the final piece of the puzzle is also around the extent to which companies are contributing positively and to solving the enormous sustainability challenges we face. So by looking through all of these different lenses, we can get a perspective on how a company is likely um, to perform um, in the future. So it's a, a multiple, I think of it as a balanced scorecard approach and certainly um, focused on looking forward rather than sort of historic data that companies um, have published. But also, if I may say, it's about finding those companies that are on a journey. We don't want to buy just the most sustainable companies today. And we are active owners of those organisations. And by working with management to um, encourage, to influence them and um, to become more sustainable in their business practices, we again believe that will lead to value add in our client portfolios. All right. Well, uh, thank you for that, Hannah. I think, uh, you know, it sounds complex enough, uh, possibly not something you want to do at home. And, and, you know, I, I can see how the professional, uh, professionally managed investments are, are kind of coming into play. Um, speaking of that, uh, and I'm just cognizant of time, um, Suway, what are the ESG products available to retail investors today? Suway? Sorry, I was on. I was on mute. Someone had to do it. <laughs> um, I think. I think Leo and, and Hannah have, have broadly touched upon this, but we have seen a huge rise in ESG um, products available to investors. You know, if I look at Europe alone, last year there were over 500 new sustainable uh, funds that that came into the market, and this was across asset classes, market exposure. Um, and themes. So, you know, increasingly investors do have to be far more discerning um, and ascertain, you know, what it is they're looking to achieve within their um, investment um, portfolio. And also in terms of flow, we've seen figures, um, you know, that more than 20 trillion is set to flow into ESG uh, funds over the next two, two decades. 
So I think as an investor, you have to think about the approach that is right for, for you and, and, and your portfolio. And Leo did touch upon this, you know, and, and Hannah did as well, you know, whether you're looking at exclusions based, you know, positively screened, is it ESG leaders that you're looking for? So you really do just want to in, um, invest, you know, in the top performing companies from an ESG perspective, or as Hannah mentioned, you know, improving companies. So, you know, therefore, from an ESG perspective, they're not the highest rated, but you can see definite improvement and you can engage with those companies as well to, to drive um, that, that improvement. Um, but broadly, you know, there are solutions available to investors along all of these strategies. Um, and you can, um, you know, look at passive or ESG focused um, ETFs. These will broadly track an index. Um, and, you know, what is available is broad ESG integrated at the regional level um, or thematic e ETFs um, as well. Um, on the active managed sort of mutual funds, um, it is the same. You can build a portfolio so you can, can, you, you can have broadly integrated um, strategies that really can be seen as a substitute for more conventional holdings. Um, or you can um, look at those more thematic um, type funds such as gender, water, you know, focused on you know, water, for example, the environment um, uh, or, or um, uh, solar um, energy. And, and the, only, the last thing that I would, would add is that, you know, I would say um, recently focus has, has pivoted um, a little bit more to fixed income uh, ESG funds. You know, there's been um, over 50 billion uh, year to date that, that, that have gone into um, ESG funds. And, and I think that this investor demand is also being met uh, with this huge increase in supply of, of green bonds and, and social bonds as well. All right, so to summarize, uh, to summarize the answer that, that you're giving Sue is uh, actively managed uh, mutual funds and, and ETFs essentially. These are the two main routes to, to and, and enter that space. Absolutely, and integrated, so you can build a core portfolio or thematic. Lovely. Okay, um, moving on, we haven't yet talked about greenwashing, and there is hardly an ESG, uh, an ESG webinar without speaking about greenwashing. So what, we, what we've noticed is greenwashing is usually top of the worry list for investors when it comes to responsible investing. And a lot of people are concerned that ESG investments were not what they claim to be. Um, how do we make sure that we avoid such pitfalls when either managing ESG compliant asset classes or as retail investors when, uh, when buying um, uh, a security, which we, which we hope to be you know, an ESG, ESG compliant one? Uh, can you give us some examples of greenwashing and how can we be sure as investors that uh, the security that we are buying or, or the issuer uh, which we are investing into is actually through the ESG investing? Uh, maybe Hannah, if you could take this one as you're, uh, as you're managing that strategy uh, and or Leo. Thomas, uh, thank you very much. And you're quite right. Um, when we talk to clients and from our own research, um, our clients tell us that um, the greenwashing is right at the top of their list of um, concerns. So for me, one of the critical things, and we have heard this um, today, is actually about transparency. Um, so moving as an industry from telling people what it is we're doing to really showing and demonstrating. So those case studies as to why a company has been included in a portfolio, has been included as a sustainable um, holding in one of your funds is truly critical. The research that's been done around that organisation and why the outcome or the conclusion um, that it is sustainable or meets that sustainability criteria is clearly critical. And this is at the heart of um, the regulatory momentum we're seeing around the globe. So here in Europe, um, they recently introduced the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regime, um, or SFDR. And one at the heart of SFDR is really the idea of um, seeking to avoid um, greenwashing. And by being incredibly tr transparent and disclosing how you go about um, investing sustainably and then reporting against that is clearly critical. So we are seeing um, a significant focus on one of those um, really key challenges within um, sustainable investment. Okay, and any examples, uh, Hannah or Leo, as, as, as to what, uh, what uh, might be going wrong with, uh, with greenwashing, as in uh, what, is, what gets re misrepresented, so to speak?
Hannah, you want to take that one? Shall I um shall I start first? Sorry. Yeah, um, go ahead. Let me pick up. So um I I mean the critical thing here, um Thomas is as I mentioned, um being a sort of able to clearly articulate and why a company um, is being held. And that, you know, that's at the heart of um, sort of seeking to avoid greenwashing. So the, you know, the things we're trying to do is make sure that you're investing in companies that, um, you know, that are doing the things that they, they are actually claiming that they're doing. So the research piece is critical here. So if a company is claiming that they have an incredibly diverse workforce, go and look at that data and seek to identify and um, whether or not they're diverse all right well that's a that's a great example okay uh i'll move on uh to our first poll we're going to ask a question to the audience i'm going to ask uh, i'm going to ask for the first poll to be displayed um, and that's a question on i would be kindly asking the audience to answer it basically it's a question of where would you consider yourself on your ESG, esg journey uh for multiple multiple choice questions uh, sincerely appreciate your answer this is our question number one embedded in my decision making process for a while at the beginning considering it for the future but haven't started the journey yet and i need more information uh kindly make your pick uh and i'll ask for the next poll to be displayed this is our poll number two Okay, poll number two, again, please uh, choose the best answer. And the poll number two is, when you think about opportunities within sustainable investing, where do you feel there is the most opportunity? Climate change, clean energy, sustainable infrastructure, sustainable and ethical agriculture, uh, circular economy, which is eliminating waste, eliminating waste and, and continual use of resources, uh, as well as diversity lens investing. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, responses. Now, if I could have the results for poll number one, let's take a look at where we stand. Um, if I could have the result for poll number one, please. I cannot see them as yet. We wait with bated breath, Thomas. <laughs> All right, actually, I do have the results now. So uh, question number one, where would you consider yourself on your ESG journey? Most of the, most of the respondents uh, actually said, so 37%, 38% said, considering it for the future, but haven't started the journey yet. And that's the number one response, um, followed by, at the beginning, made a few select investments followed by I need to see more information and only 12.8% of the audience responded it's been embedded in my decision making process for a while. I think uh, it's fair to say that you know majority is kind of uh, either at the beginning or, or hasn't hasn't done it yet. Uh, Su Wei, how does that compare to your experience with uh, with your clients? Yeah, I would say very um, similar. I, I mean, um, within the private bank, we have quite a range of clients, you know, sophisticated family offices and, and wealthy individuals. But in, in my experience, if I if I just look at this year, you know, we've all been in this pandemic. Um, we've all seen, um, you know, pressures of society. We've all seen companies and, and, and governments really trying to pave um, the, the way. Um, and so a lot of the conversations that I've had at the start of the year have actually been with clients that have said to me, you know, um, I, I have this wealth. I have a young family. I want to be doing good. I, I feel it's my responsibility to look after the planet, you know, for my children. But how can I go about it? Um, and, you know, I would say in the ESG, well, there's been there's been a few generalizations. So I think that, you know, uh, there's been a lot of talk that women and millennials um, are, are driving this change. And, you know, definitely both of these groups are going to be huge, you know, generators of, of future wealth. And they, you know, they, they do have a, a vested interest. 
But from what I've seen in more recent times, it's actually far widespread, more widespread than that. You know, it's across all clients, it's across all gen um, you know, generations um, and genders that are increasingly interested in starting um, the ESG journey. And I think it goes back to my earlier point that you know, more education is needed. You know, we've seen this huge rise, rise in ESG, and so you know, investors need to be informed. What does it mean? You know, I'm investing in these in, in these strategies, but what does it actually entail? What are the companies um, that are building this this portfolio? Okay. Um, Thomas, Thomas, I just wanted to add to um, Sue Wei's comment, if I may, because um, some of our own research um, absolutely um, mirrors what Sue Wei was saying, and in fact, what we've seen um, recently is um, a very significant uptake in interest from um, older investors. And I, um, I think about it, or I liken it to the Greta Thunberg effect where um, grandchildren are going to their grandparents and explaining to them um, the work that Greta has been doing um, around climate and asking them to go and invest sustainably. So I think that's just a, a you know a fantastic way of not only are we seeing um, a growing number of um, sort of investors of all types seeking more sustainable um, investment options, but also just that voice of um, young people being heard through that lens. Thank you. Thank you for that, Hannah. Uh, in fact, I, I uh, wanted to give you a chance to speak about the second poll, uh, because that results of that poll have just come in. I'm just looking at the results. The question was, when you think about opportunities within sustainable investing, where do you feel there is most opportunity? Uh, and the results that have come in indicate that 60%, so the, the, the majority of the audience voted for answer number one, which is climate change and clean energy. And the rest of the answers are pretty, pretty well distributed between the, the other responses. Uh, how do you how do you feel about that, uh, Hannah? Is um, that what Schroders uh, also sees as the key um, opportunity within sustainable investing? Um, I, I think it's fair to say we see opportunities um, across that entire lens. So all of those options um, you you gave our audience. But what I would say when we ask clients, we get very very similar responses back. I think there is a recognition um, of the enormity of the climate crisis that we face, that we potentially face. And also, if we solve part of the, the climate crisis, then we can look to solving all of these others. But if we are not careful, if we don't focus enough on the climate piece, then um, you know, the, the challenges around um, the circular economy and the diversity lens, well, we never get to solve them because we don't have a planet um, that will look after us. So I, I definitely um, see very, very similar results um, from our, our, our audience, from our clients. What I would highlight is that um, particularly things like um, the um, sustainable um, food, um, so coming under your sustainable and ethical agriculture, that's certainly an area we're seeing greater focus on, and also um, the diversity lens um, as well. I think we may have lost Thomas. Thomas, are you still there? Hi, I'm sorry. I think we've we've lost connectivity for a for a second. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me. Hannah, can yes. you hear me? Loud and clear, Thomas. Yes, welcome back. Sorry, sorry about that. We got disconnected. Um, jumping straight uh, back in. Thank you for that. I wanted to ask you the last question uh, since uh, since uh, we have you here on the line. Uh, future of ESG. Uh, uh, Leo, maybe you want to take a shot at this. Uh, 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 what is what is it that we're? What are the what are the important forward trends you think? So I definitely think we see ESG from becoming a kind of a, a niche to really becoming a mainstream. And I think that's because of uh, two reasons. First of all, some of these um, regulatory policies, which, uh, for example, uh, Hannah mentioned uh, as part of the uh, 
SFDR, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulations, as well as, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that were set by the uh, United Nations in, in, in 2015, as well as client demand, right, which uh, both Sue and, and Hannah elaborated uh, on as well, right? And I think that forces companies to obviously become more transparent about their environmental goals and how they're dealing with sustainability uh, risks, right? You can imagine that it might become much more difficult for a company that uh, doesn't adhere to some sustainable uh, sustainable uh, goals to to raise capital going forward, for for example. So I definitely think we see ESG becoming more mainstream at the moment. Okay, lovely. Same question, uh, ladies. Uh, so why? Yeah, I, I mean, ESG? I would I would agree with with Leo that you know we're starting to see ESG and sustainable investing really become uh, the new normal, driven by um, investor um, demand and. You know, Leah's already mentioned the regulatory side. I think, you know, two just other things that I would mention, you know, data will be key, you know, the transparency that will be continued, um, you know, the, there'll be continued focus on that. And, and finally, I think, and hopefully it, it'll mean new approaches and technologies um, really to help drive a lot of these agendas forward. You know, um, if you look at hydrogen, if you look at carbon capture, for example, um, I think there'll, there'll be a lot of innovation um, over the next you know, couple of decades to try and um, you know, solve for this climate crisis. All right, um, thank you. I'm just looking at the clock and uh, I think we're slowly, slowly kind of running out of time. So I'll move on to the, to the Q&A. We have, uh, we have uh, foreseen for a short q and I'm just gonna see what questions we have from the audience. And if you guys don't mind, I'll, I'll read out one or two, uh, one or two questions. Uh, Hannah, I see one question, um, which I think you are the best, uh, best suited to answer. Uh, and that is, are ESG investment funds more expensive than traditional ones? Um, thank you very much, Thomas. That's an excellent question. So thank you to the audience member who asked that. And um, when um, Su Wei was talking about the, the sort of what types of funds are, are really growing up um, under sustainable um, investing, she highlighted that um, really it's active approaches. So what I would you know, say is that in my experience, and certainly this is true at Schroeder's, our um, sustainable investment funds are no more expensive than our um, mainstream. And um, I'd certainly echo those comments around um, sustainable investing becoming more mainstream in the future. And what I would say is that um, sort of it is more expensive than passive approaches. But I, I think that the, the key thing is that for an active fund, there is um, no differential. Um, okay, uh, what about the costs? Uh, what about the costs, uh, uh, Hannah? Would it be more expensive or, or, or would you say no? As no. in the active funds versus, uh, sorry, not even the active funds. The ESG investments in comparison to the traditional investments, do we pay higher fees, higher charges? Is that how it works? Certainly not um, in, uh, in our experience here at Schroeder's. They, those funds are, pay, uh, are, are charged comparatively um, the same. Um, there, are, you know, there are data needs, there are um, research costs to sustainability, but that is a cost um, that is embedded and, uh, and borne by the whole of um, Schroeder's, so no more expensive in our experience. Lovely. I'm sure the investors, potential investors, are, are very happy to hear that, Hannah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. I have here another question, and I think that will be our last question, uh, given we are uh, nearing uh, 15 minutes here. Um, uh, green bonds, are green bonds any different from regular bonds? Leo, maybe you want to take uh, this one. Yeah, and another good uh, question. So basically green bonds or client bonds are those bonds where the proceeds are earmarked to benefit an um, environmental uh, or climate benefit. Uh, think of, for example, renewable energy or pollution reduction or water management, for example, right? And green bonds sometimes have uh, tax incentives to incentivize the uh, investor to invest in these bonds and uh, are often judged by the 
climate uh, bond standard board, with, which basically judges whether the proceeds of the bonds are truly going to an uh, environmental or climate benefit. So uh, that's all about green bonds. Okay, um, lovely. Thank you for that. Thank you, Leo. I think looking at the clock, we will we will end it here. Uh, I think this concludes the Q and A session. We'll try to answer some of the questions which we didn't answer in this in this session. We'll try to answer them uh, remotely. A sincere thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your participation in this EAG webinar. Uh, I do hope, and we all hope, that you found it useful and interesting both. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you to our guest speakers, Hannah, Suwei, and Leo. Thank you so much for your participation and your your answers here. I really appreciate that on behalf of uh, CBank UAE and myself. Uh, thank you, thank you to all of you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your participation, for your attention over the last one hour. Uh, if you have any further questions, please speak to your uh, relationship manager, um, uh, or if you would like asset allocation advice. And if you're not a City Gold client yet, please drop us a line, and we will have someone contact you. A replay will be available online. Thank you. Have a nice evening and goodbye.